Welcome back to Fusion 22. And if you're watching online and have just joined us, this is Fusion 22 from London, and we are delighted to have you wherever you are in the world. And we would love you to join in online as well. Our chat function, we had a few gremlins with it this morning. It should be working uh, later. Um, but we would love you to um, go into the chat and also ask questions throughout this session, plus explore our virtual um, exhibitor booths as well. Now, to guide us through the incredible progress that is being made around the world, please welcome onto stage the founder and CEO of Fusion Energy Insights, it's Dr. Melanie Windridge. Thank you, Valerie, and hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on global gains, where we're going to be looking at the progress of fusion energy. So I'm Dr. Melanie Windridge. I'm the founder of Fusion Energy Insights, and we help people keep up to date with developments in the growing fusion industry. And one of the things that we do is we have a blog uh, where we talk about or write about the significance of some of the biggest recent news stories. And uh, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have a look at some of the achievements in fusion energy, and I'm going to try and give you a bit of perspective on these achievements. So today we're going to be uh, going around the world, and we've got some videos from different organizations around the world who are going to be telling us about their progress in fusion. And we also uh, ha are really lucky to have Laban Koblenz from ETA, who's going to be here in person telling us about the progress over there. And it's not just what's happening in the public laboratories either. We've also got a video from Andrew Holland, the Fusion Industry Association, who's going to be highlighting the progress in the private sector. And this is important because one of the exciting things about Fusion at the moment is the growth in the private industry and the increase in partnerships between the public sector and the private sector in fusion. So let's get into it. So first of all, uh, we're starting right here in the UK. Uh, I should mention that the little pin on the map is uh, highlighting the country, not the location. So we're here in London, and uh, the Fusion Laboratory in the UK is at Cullum, which is just south of Oxfordshire. So now we're going to have the video from UK AEA.
So it's really lovely there to see the range of facilities at uh, Cullum UK AEA, from the Jet Tokamak to Mast and in the future STEP. And STEP is the uh, pilot plant that uh, the UK has committed to building. And uh, you saw there that the, some of the big news recently with STEP is that they've decided on the site, so where it's going to be built. It's going to be built in Nottingham, uh, Nottinghamshire. So the big news from JET this year was that they've um, beaten their, their previous fusion world record. So what did they achieve? Well, they achieved 59 megajoules of energy from fusion reactions, and they sustained that for five seconds. What's the significance of this? Well, five seconds is a long time on fusion timescales. In plasma physics, uh, it's about 10 times the energy confinement time. And this is the time it takes for the, the heat of the plasma to, to leak out. So five seconds is a long time in fusion. And so this gives us confidence that uh, if you can hold it for five seconds, then you can hold it for longer. So when you get into a, a superconducting tokamak, uh, then you'll be able to, to hold this, uh, this plasma stable for longer. So that's uh, the significance of that, the five seconds. It also shows the importance of advancing fusion technology because JET last did um, experiments with the deuterium and tritium fuel in 1997. And the results that they got this time have doubled the fusion performance. And it's on the same machine. Now, in the, in the interim, there have been upgrades on JET. And particularly, they had a new wall fitted. So the inner wall has changed. And it's become like the wall that's going to be used for the ETA tokamak, which is being built in France. And so this gives us confidence that uh, that the, the ETA will work um, as, as predicted, but also it shows the performance enhancements that's possible by making these upgrades to the same machine. So it shows the importance of the advancing technology. It also shows that the, the tokamak is um, a well understood concept and it can be optimized to increase fusion energy production. So now we're going to be moving on from the UK and we're heading over to Asia where we're going to see some videos from East in China and also from JT60SA in Japan. So let's go on to East. Experimental advanced superconducting tokamak. East is the first fully superconducting tokamak device designed and developed by Institute of Plasma Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences, ASSIB. In 2021, East achieved new milestones for tokamak operation twice. East realized 1,056 seconds long pulse high parameter plasma operation and reproducible plasmas with 120 million degrees sustained for 101 seconds. East has become the first tokamak that can operate with a pulse length in thousand second scale, with plasma temperatures in the tens of million degrees Celsius and self-driven current. As foreseen for the ITER Q, no less than five long pulse in steady stage scenarios. A great challenge for fusion energy research is to maintain the confinement of a burning plasma for sufficiently long duration and with a high duty cycle. East has Video. Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak. East is the first fully superconducting tokamak device designed and developed by Institute of Plasma Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences, ASIP. In 2021, East achieved new milestones for tokamak operation twice. East realized 1,056 seconds long pulse high parameter plasma operation and reproducible plasmas with 120 million degrees sustained for 101 seconds. East has become the first tokamak that can operate with a pulse length in thousand second scale with plasma temperatures in the tens of million degrees Celsius and self-driven current. As foreseen for the ITER Q, no less than five long pulse in steady stage scenarios. A great challenge for fusion energy research is to maintain the confinement of a burning plasma for sufficiently long duration and with a high duty cycle. EAST has demonstrated that such challenges can be resolved. The success of EAST's experiment in maintaining high temperature plasma beyond 1,000 seconds 
is an important milestone on the way to exploring and controlling plasmas that will be required for either in future fusion reactors. Beyond the East, ASAP is contributing over 70% of Chinese procurement packages for ITER, mainly on magnet, power supplies, and conductors. ASAP towards the fusion reactor by constructing a next step infrastructure, comprehensive research facility for fusion technology craft. It would be an engineering test event for global fusion community. So interesting to see um, all the work that's going on in China. And the, uh, what's interesting about the, the East tokamak is that it's a superconducting tokamak. And uh, I mentioned before that if you've got a superconducting um, tokamak, so superconducting magnets, then you can keep that um, machine going for longer. So machines that have copper magnets, such as JET, are limited in how long that they, they can actually work for because the, the copper magnets heat up. They get, they get hot, and so that limits their, um, their operation time. Whereas a superconducting magnet, superconductors don't uh, heat up, they have no resistance, and so that means that the magnets can work for longer and the tokamak can work for longer. And so future power plants for, f for fusion in the tokamaks uh, will have superconducting magnets. And so EAST is testing these uh, superconducting magnets uh, you know, with the, you know, in the tokamak configuration. And so a key achievement here is that they've achieved plasma temperatures of 120 million degrees for over a thousand seconds. So that's over about 15 minutes. And uh, what's the significance of this? Well, 100 million degrees is fusion temperatures. So they're getting into the, the range of fusion conditions that we need for a, a power station. And, uh, and they're holding it there and they're holding it stable uh, for a significant time. So that bodes well for future tokamak devices such as ITER and uh, future power plants. They're also testing scenarios that are relevant to ITER operation. And so this gives confidence for getting to Q greater than one, which is what we call um, energy break even. So more energy out of the reaction than we put in, which is clearly quite important if we want to make a power station. So uh, these scenarios that they're testing give us uh, confidence that ITER will achieve this. So um, next we are going over to, uh, to see uh, Japan, to see JT60 SA. Tokamak project in Japan. Let's leave London for a moment and take a trip to Naka site in Japan. Naka Fusion Institute is located about 100 kilometers north from Tokyo. Previously home to JT60, triple world record holder for plasma performance, and now home to the brand new machine, JT60 SA Tokamak. JT60 SA is a uniquely collaborative undertaking. The engineers and researchers from across the Europe and Japan have been integrated into a single project teams irrespective of their locations or institutions. This virtual organization has delivered the world's largest superconducting tokamak to date and it is 15.5 meters in height and 13.5 meters in diameter. What's special about the JT6 SA is that it will bring together high performance with sustained performance. This is not just a flashing can. JT6 SA was designed to keep large plasma hot, dense, and stable for 100 seconds at a time and could open the door to more economic power generations. The assembly began in 2010. A number of superconducting coils and vessel parts were carefully blown to the holes and installed. Thermal seals are necessary to ensure cold temperature in the coils. Installation of very tall coils required very strict accuracies, less than 1 mm. It was achieved with sophisticated engineers. The machine assembly was completed in 2020. Our experience from construction and commissioning in the last years is already benefiting other projects like ITER. And right now, we are looking forward to seeing our first plasma in JT60 SA next year, 2023. See you in JT60 SA! 
So it's lovely there to see uh, the JT60SA coming together and also the spirit of the researchers as they anticipate First Plasma next year. So what's the achievement here? It's the world's largest superconducting tokamak and it's ready for operations in 2023. And what's the significance of this? Well, they are testing high performance plus sustained performance. So they want to get uh, high temperature and high density plasmas and they're going to hold it stable. And so this comes down to uh, something that we call the Lawson criteria, criteria which we need uh, to achieve fusion. You need to essentially get your plasma hot enough and dense enough and keep it like that for long enough for fusion to occur. And so this is uh, what JT60SA is going to be testing. Also, they've had a, a collaborative um, experience um, in building JT60SA, and this experience is going to be benefiting other projects. Also, they've been making use of technical innovations and avoiding complexity in key components, and this has enabled them to keep the costs down. And these kind of activities are really important if we're moving towards uh, commercializing fusion, because we want to make a, um, an economical power plant and, and keep the costs down as much as possible. So, from here, we are heading over to uh, America, and we're going to. We've heard a lot about tokamaks so far, and we're going to be hearing about laser fusion as we visit NIF. So, please, can we have the video from NIF? of this shot is the psychological effect of making people understand the vision is achievable and that you know with a little bit more work on NIF I don't know how long it'll take but we'll get to that you know to that golden ring of ignition uh, in terms of actually reaching um, uh, you know break even in terms of the laser energy and, and the energy out. of having places like this lab is to do things that are incredibly difficult. And, you know, if it weren't impossible, you wouldn't need Livermore. We're here to take on the biggest, most gnarly technical challenges that our country, the world, face uh, and bring forward solutions. So lovely to see that from the National Ignition Facility. I remember when the news came out, there was a lot of excitement and press uh, around this news. So what did they do? Um, they achieved 1.3 megajoules of fusion energy. And this is on the threshold of a self-sustaining reaction, or what they call ignition. And so what's, uh, what's important about this is that ignition is an important milestone on the way to commercial fusion. And so ignition is like, the, the plasma burn. So it's a bit beyond break-even, um, which doesn't, the break-even doesn't consider the losses to the system, whereas ignition is like when the, when the plasma burns. So it's a bit like if you want to start a fire, then you can strike a match and you can get a flame, but if you want the fire to keep going, then you need to get the logs in the center hot enough uh, so that uh, it keeps on burning. So ignition is an important milestone uh, on the way. 
And also, they've showed very fast progress. So the experiments that they did in the summer last year showed an eight-fold increase over the ones that they did in the spring. So um, that was a, a very fast progress. And so we're looking forward to, to seeing like, what else comes out from NIF in the future. So next, we're going to be going over to um, the east coast of America, and we're going to be hearing from the Fusion Industry Association. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew Holland, CEO of the Fusion Industry Association. We're the organization that brings together the investor-backed private companies working to commercialize fusion energy. I wanted to thank the UK AEA and the Fusion Cluster for putting together Fusion 22 and say that I'm sorry I couldn't join you all in person. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., but our membership is global, as is our ambition. We have 29 member companies all working on different ways of commercializing fusion energy, and then we have more than 50 affiliate members who are part of the growing industry. And we're always looking for new members to join. It's a really important time in fusion right now. We're at an, an inflection point where a long-time scientific research program moves from the lab to the marketplace. The last 18 months or so have seen real breakthroughs that show that fusion is no longer a science experiment, but is becoming a viable business opportunity. And you'll hear today in other videos and from other speakers about the tremendous scientific achievements on the publicly funded side around the world. But I wanted to take this opportunity to show you some of the recent scientific breakthroughs from private fusion. These breakthroughs are driving investor confidence. Private fusion has brought in over $5 billion in total investment, with more than half of that in just the last 12 months alone. That allows us to make bold and ambitious targets of getting multiple fusion pilot plants producing energy in a decade. But maybe I'm not the best one to explain this. The FIA runs a fusion news series on our YouTube channel that you all should take a look at and watch sometime, where some of the smartest up and coming fusion leaders talk about advances in fusion. So now I'm gonna turn it over to our fusion news presenters to explain these breakthroughs from some of the FIA's member companies. Now using their current device, ST40, Tokamak Energy was recently able to achieve a plasma temperature of 100 million degrees Celsius. But what makes these results from Tokamak Energy so impressive is that this is the record temperature for any spherical Tokamak and any privately funded Tokamak, period. What's more, this high temperature plasma has been achieved with remarkable efficiency. ST40 was built by Tokamak Energy in only five years and with a budget less than 70 million US dollars. And it's a small machine as well, with a major radius of only 40 centimeters. Compare this to Jet in the UK, which cost around $500 million in today's money to build and has a major radius of three meters. It's easy to see the remarkable efficiency and compactness of Tokamak Energy's machine. Helion passes 100 million degrees Celsius. Helion Energy recently announced that they have exceeded plasma temperatures of over 100 million degrees Celsius, or around 10 keV, making them the first private company to do so. They were able to reach this goal with their prototype, Trenta, during a 16-month campaign. Helion is pursuing a unique reactor design that uses a compressed field reverse configuration, deuterium and helium-3 fuel, and direct drive electricity generation. Helion CEO and founder David Kirtley says, these achievements represent breakthroughs with major implications for how the world meets its expanding future electricity needs while dramatically reducing climate impact on a relevant timescale. HB11 Energy achieves world first hydrogen fusion milestone with a laser, plans 20 million US dollar Series A. Sydney based startup and Fusion Industry Association member HB11 has hit the news off the back of recent experimental results published in the scientific journal Applied Sciences. Instead of combining the hydrogen isotopes deuterium and tritium to produce energetic neutrons, HB11 Energy's recent publication demonstrates that they were able to generate fusion reactions between hydrogen and boron. According to the article, 140 billion alpha particles were produced. To put that in context, when you add one proton to one boron nucleus, the product is three alpha particles. So this result implies that a large number of fusion reactions occurred. British fusion startup and FIA member First Light Fusion has demonstrated fusion for the first time using their unique approach to inertial confinement fusion, as reported in multiple news outlets. They use a high-velocity gas gun to hit their highly engineered target and compress deuterium fuel. Their fusion demonstration has now been verified by the UK AEA. Dr. Nick Hawker, CEO of First Light Fusion said, with this result, we have proven our new method for inertial fusion works. 
And more importantly, we have proven our design process. MIT Designed Project achieves a major advance towards fusion energy. Last week, Commonwealth Fusion Systems announced a successful test of their 20 Tesla high temperature superconducting magnet, making it the most powerful HTS magnet ever built. The 10 foot tall magnet was built in collaboration with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology as a proof of concept for their compact high field magnetic fusion design, which relies on the distinctive properties of HTS to make a smaller, less expensive fusion device. Prior to this test, the use of HTS at this scale had not been demonstrated. So this is an important technical milestone for CFS. Nuclear fusion firm hits funding record with plasma breakthrough. TAE Technologies is a company seeking to commercialize proton boron fusion through what's called a field reverse configuration device. The company recently achieved a plasma temperature of 50 million degrees in their compact reactor called Norman. As of this week, the company has raised more than $880 million from a number of different international investors. Zap Energy recently generated their first plasma in their device, FuseQ, which is designed to reach Q equals 1, the point at which the energy produced by the fusion reaction equals the energy put into the plasma. They also recently closed their Series C funding with $160 million. I hope you see why we say that fusion energy is coming faster than most expect. If you want to help bring clean, safe, sustainable, and secure fusion to our energy systems, I'd welcome you to subscribe to Fusion News on YouTube, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, and check out our website, fusionindustryassociation.org, to subscribe. We really need all hands on deck to create the fusion industry. Have a great meeting, and thank you. Well, you can see there's a lot of activity there, and you would expect that with more than 30 private companies now uh, working towards fusion. Um, so just to summarize quickly those, uh, some of the achievements that we saw in that video, there are, um, we've achieved 100 million degrees in Tokamak Energy's small spherical Tokamak and also in Helion's plasma accelerator. Uh, we saw the first achievement of fusion in novel approaches by First Light Fusion and HB11. We also saw the demonstration of high temperature superconducting or HTS magnets um, by Commonwealth Fusion Systems. And we've seen large fundraisers by uh, TAE Technologies and Zap Energy after they hit some of their milestones. So what are the significance of some of these achievements? Well, we can see that some private company um, magnetic devices are close to achieving fusion conditions, uh, which is a good step on the way to, uh, to fusion. We're also seeing new approaches demonstrating early fusion. Uh, this is really exciting because some of these different new approaches may offer smaller, cheaper routes to fusion. We're also seeing uh, the development of HTS, or high temperature superconducting magnet technology. And this is sometimes seen as a game changer for fusion. These um, magnets can make higher magnetic fields at more attainable temperatures, and maybe in smaller spaces as well. So they can be um, you know, really uh, a useful technology for economic fusion in tokamaks and probably in other approaches too. I think that about half of the private fusion companies uh, are thinking about using high temperature superconducting magnets in their devices. We're also seeing that there are lots of different companies with different designs and different approaches. And this is significant because it's all adding to uh, the knowledge in the industry and it's also developing enabling technologies. So it's great that there are so many different companies um, working towards fusion. So uh, next we have, oh, I, one other thing I'd like to mention about um, news in the private sector as well is we're seeing more news about uh, partnerships and that's really important too. So um, in the US just recently, they announced uh, $50 million for, uh, for a private partnership, a private public partnership. Um, and we've also seen in the news just recently, UK AEA announced a five-year framework agreement with uh, startup Tokamak Energy. There's also um, General Fusion is going to be building their fusion power demonstrator on the Cullum site. So we're seeing um, more and more partnerships between the public sector and the private sector. And I think that this is really important because it's going to help with the uh, tackling the, the remaining fusion uh, or challenges towards commercial fusion. It's also going to help with building um, the fusion industry uh, and it's going to drive us towards fusion. So this is really positive. So um, moving on now, I'd like to uh, take us from America back to Europe. And uh, we're really lucky to have Laban Koblenz from ETA here. To, he's the head of communications at ETA, and he's going to tell us about the progress there. So Laban, welcome.
Thanks very much. Um, if you will pull up my presentation, I'll get going. It's really great to see the diversity here. It's, uh, I, I've just been noticing not just, not just gender, but also age, the, the, the young people um, here, because you're going to be the next generation. So talking about the ITER project, look, you, many of you are going to be familiar with this. I'm going to take you on a rapid photo tour, which is essentially how did we spend COVID-19. Uh, I'll look back at about the, last, about the last two years because we had this choice. We're a massive site about a kilometer long, about 400 meters wide, and there we've been making reasonably steady progress uh, for about the last 10 years. This is what it looked like when I got there um, some time ago. We're now getting close to, I would say, 80% uh, completion, both the civil works and the, and the, um, the uh, assembly. But I would also say that if you listen closely to the end, I'm going to get bad news in there as well. I'll give you a little twist at the end because I want to be very open today about the technical challenges that we're facing. We don't just learn from successes. We learn also from failures. So when COVID hit, watch the dates on this. So when COVID hit March 2020, this is where we were standing. We were trying to connect this crane hall so that we could actually bring things in the back, do the assembly, and, and start to assemble the tokamak. Um, within about two months after that, and you see the, you see the different flags on here. I'll, there's a German flag. Normally, I would say European. But this was a, uh, an Indian-built component that was too large to ship. This is the base of our cryostat, 30 meters in diameter. And therefore, uh, the, the question was, could this really be shipped? No. We had a crack team of German welders under French nuclear regulation uh, under uh, Indian supervision on an international site putting this together. So this is the top-down view when it goes into the tokamak. You see all of those lines. Those are welding lines. And yet, with a 30-meter diameter, we got in with under 3 uh, millimeters of clearance. So a lot of what ITER's been doing, global supply chains, uh, massive components, first-of-a-kind technology, or just first-of-a-kind scale in terms of precision. There's the lower cylinder going in. Again, I've got Germany and India on there. And then the Korean built uh, uh, one of two sets of thermal shields. So that thermal shield goes into the cryostat. These are our first two magnets. So this is now by April 2021. I'll show you the shipment. But this is the Chinese built first poloidal field coil going in. And then European built at 17 meters. It was too big to bring up the road. So that, that was actually built there on site. Now we get to about May, June of 2021, and here you have a Korean vacuum vessel sector, a double-walled vacuum vessel sector, and there lying on, the, on its side on what we call an upending tool is a Japanese-made TF coil. So what you do for a whole module is take one vacuum vessel sector, a piece of thermal shield, and two of these coils. So that, that coil is weighing roughly the, uh, the same as a, as, as a Boeing 747, so about 360 tons. The thermal shield, the shiny silver part, goes in between. So putting this whole thing together, now the second one, requires the use of these gigantic tools, also made in Korea, where they can sort of hold the vacuum vessel sector here and put the two toroidal field coils or the two pieces of thermal shield and bring them together with a dimension in terms of measurement under a millimeter, this way, this way, and this way. And so part of this process of assembly is not just bringing things from around the world, but also finding a way to get them to, um, to fit together uh, all the diverse parts with the necessary precision for fusion. So as of May of 2022, just earlier this year, we got to the point where the first vacuum vessel sector module was really uh, installed. That's about a six story tall assembly coming over the wall and going in there with about 20 uh, centimeters of, uh, of clearance. And just more, more recently, just last month, we finally got the two TF coils aligned. That's the good news. I'll bring you some of the more challenging news in a minute. So the central solenoid modules, this is the US built central magnet, about a thousand ton magnet. Um, and again, we're not working with the high temperature superconductors. We're still working with niobium tin, niobium titanium, which is a, a lesser magnetic field than what some of our, our private sector colleagues are coming out with. But the two central solenoid modules, they will actually be, uh, we're starting to assemble now, there will be six of those plus a spare. So then around the plant, we're also uh, seeing the input from different countries here, Europe and India uh, supplying the cryogenics plant, which will uh, produce roughly 25,000 tons of liquid helium, um, uh, circulate that. 
These are the Russian yellow bus bars, sort of big extension cords. And if you have a question about the conflict in, in Ukraine, um, these, this, some of these shipments have been occurring across Europe even during that. You can ask me about that if you're curious about the effects and so forth. But we've continued again. And there are Chinese, as well as Russian, Chinese, Indian, and Korean components on the mag magnet uh, power conversion systems. Then here are the switch yards. The first one's pretty normal. That's a US supplied switch yard. The second one is the more pulsed power, not steady state, but, but more uh, reactive power compensation, sort of a gigantic capacitor that can take a, a big load of electricity and, and shoot it in, in a microsecond uh, spark. And then here, the cooling water system, m many of these now going into uh, system commissioning, the cooling water system largely built by Europe and, and uh, India. On site, we've been manufacturing, as you already saw, some of the magnets that are too big to, um, to ship and then global manufacturing. So in addition to our, our central solenoid and the D-shaped coils and the circular coils, we've got these 10-ton small correction coils going in, largely made by China. There's India finishing finally the, the lid to the cryostat, Europe finishing some of the vacuum vessel sectors, Japan working on the TF coils, uh, Korea also working on vacuum vessel sectors, uh, US working on its solenoid modules. This magnet at bottom left is um, the final uh, uh, magnet sitting in, the final poloidal magnet, which is sitting in St. Petersburg now, uh, should be shipping in just a couple of weeks uh, from St. Petersburg to Marseille. So that gives you your global tour of, uh, of what, the, uh, what the upgraded status is. I would just say the twist. So the twist, the challenges. We've, we've found several things. We found things about the conformity of the two vacuum vessels, of the vacuum vessel sectors in terms of how they align to make a pressure barrier. We're working on how that's going to work. And recently we found that in the thermal shields, which is a very thin piece of metal, silver coated with tiny channels in between, uh, uh, co cooling channels for liquid, uh, for gaseous helium at about minus 80 degrees, that some of those we found corrosion. So we're actually in the middle of kind of a rework um, our leadership is also in transition. I think that many of you know that we lost uh, Bernard Bigot, our director general, in May. So we now, just yesterday, I got a new boss. Um, Pietro Barabaschi came on starting in his new role, and we're doing some review. It's, po it's quite possible that we will have to do some disassembly to fix some of the corrosion. So stay tuned. Um, these, if this was a Netflix series, this is the part where we close off and you say, you know, sort of what's happening next week? Are they going to be able to solve this? So we certainly have been solving a lot of the impossible things. That's what goes with this size of a project. But my God, are we learning? And, and the, 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 the ability, I was talking to Dennis White from MIT and Spark earlier today, and, and it's gratifying to hear that the lessons that we're doing at ITER are also then uh, uh, going to others. So. I will welcome Melanie and, and uh, Valeria back on to, uh, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Levin. Thank you. Really interesting to, uh, to see all those pictures of the construction and how that's all going, and really to get a global picture. Um, ITER is an incredible feat of engineering. And one significant thing that I want to mention quickly before we go to the Q&A is um, even before ITER is operating, it's doing like, a huge amount for developing the supply chains and the industrial capabilities um, in fusion. So, uh, as you can see, uh, there's a lot going on in fusion. I hope you've enjoyed our global tour. And, uh, Obviously, we hope to see more progress um, in coming years. Valerie, please, we're going to have a Q&A now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Melanie and Laban, for a truly, truly breathtaking uh, tour around um, the world of fusion. Um, so we've got uh, seven minutes left for our Q&A. I'm sure there are going to be tons of questions um, from the audience. Um, we have our roving mics. So who would like to? We have a question. Um, over here, if you could just um, wait for the microphone, please, and uh, stand up and introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi there, uh, Nick Walkden, Fraser Nash. Um, sorry to start slightly politically, um, but with uh, with what Labour you were saying about the, the scale and challenge of ETA and the number of impossible things you need to do, do you see what what sort of role do you well uh, and it shows today with the people gathered in this room that the UK has a huge amount of capability and world-class expertise. What sort of role do you see the UK taking in helping ETA along that journey in the future? 
Well, Brexit happened. So, you know, the, the European management of ITER as kind of the biggest member goes through Euratom. And um, all of the parties associated have pledged that the UK is going to come back and they're going to get inside Euratom again. We've got the same hiccup with Switzerland for different reasons, not related to Brexit. So uh, as it is on site, there's something weird term called construction management as agent, which is the big uh, three company consortium that helps us manage the project. And right now, the biggest member of that is a UK company. So those contracts are continuing. What we'd like to do is to get over the boundaries and fishing and everything else and, and let um, let uh, all of the, all of the uh, negotiations finish and get the UK back in. But regardless, scientists have a way of finding collaboration across those political issues. They certainly do. Um, if you're watching online, um, please uh, do send in your Q&A. We've got an online question from Simon Keynes who um, has noted that when the tokamaks are producing plasmas, they're shutting down after a few seconds. Why is that? Is it they're running out of fuel or uh, instability, something else? Melanie? Well, it, it depends on, on the tokamaks, but and it, they're experiments. So um, I mentioned before about the, uh, the superconducting magnets versus the, um, the copper magnets. And uh, so if, you, if you're using a copper magnet or magnet set, then um, the, the time for which you can operate is limited. So some of the tokamaks experiments are just, are just limited in time by how long the magnets can operate for before they get too hot. Um, and sometimes that's just, you know, uh, like under a minute, matter, small uh, seconds sometimes, depending on the size of, of the machine. Um, but also it depends what they're studying. So they might be studying disruptions, for example, and that means that's something that happens when the uh, when the when the plasma shuts itself down, so in the conditions when it's unstable, uh, so they might be studying that. They might be, um, uh, yeah, the experiments like might be shutting themselves down. So they're trying to find out more about the instability. So there are various reasons why the experiments might be only operating for a few seconds. But it's not all of the the copper magnet ones are limited in time anyway. So it's not just that instabilities are shutting them down. They are going to uh, even in an, an ordinary experiment, they'll just sort of ramp it up operate it for a while, ramp it back down. And that's limited by the magnets, the, how long they can go for. And, and you made the point that five seconds or just a thousand seconds, that's a long time in fusion time. Exactly. Um, uh, any more questions in the room? Um, we have one here. Thank you. I'm Lilia from Shell Ventures. Uh, um, Alaban mentioned the, the issue of corrosion that you experienced. Um, uh, so uh, my question is around iteration. So obviously we know some um, technologies out there, such as stellarators or solutions by, um, for instance, Zap Energy, um, smaller and potentially less, less capex heavy, uh, and allow for uh, for maybe easier iteration. Uh, what about um, uh, ITER Tokamak? Uh, obviously, it's a huge machine. Uh, um, how easy it will be to sort of like address issues and uh, and revise and iterate? Yeah. Um, I think that what's important to, to say about ITER is we don't want to iterate it. In other words, ITER is a giant experimental device that will, you know, if everything goes really well and every company out here that's made their pledges and their, their timelines succeeds, which probably won't happen, but even if that happens, ITER will remain the experimental device when you can, where you can really study. You know, I think Bob Mumgard was saying a while back that just because you got um, you know, fantastic jetliners or, or this or this in uh, advances in air travel, you didn't start using wind tunnels. Um, Jane Hotchkiss of Energy for the Common Good sitting there beside you likes to say that if, if, if fusion is our moonshot, ITER is a practice moon. We're not a practical device at all. We've got far, far more penetrations. We've got a gigantic building devoted to diagnostics. So if we can come through with the Model T, everybody's going to be congratulating. But ITER will help us get to the whatever that is, BMW or Tesla, um, you know, we're going to continue to use all of those, all of those uh, experimental aspects to, to hone things in uh, going forward and, and optimize the machines of the future. Thank you, Laban. Um, we have another question um, down here from... Hi, everyone. Um, I should declare an interest. So I'm UK AEA Director of Decommissioning. Um, I'm very excited about all of the um, plasma um, physics work that's being described here today. 
But as an engineer, the thing that gets me going is what are we going to do with it at the end? So how do we build innovation in our fusion um, cluster that we're building here? Um, and how do we collaborate um, for decommissioning going forward? I'm happy to I'm happy to take a crack at it. I think you know Melanie might also be a, a better source on this. First of all, um, fusion doesn't work unless it's global, and so we've got to think in terms of the soft aspects as well. Right now, a lot of our focus, correctly and necessarily, is on the technology and the science, and that's really what we've, we we know the things that we have to solve. The advent of public-private partnerships mean that we can identify challenges that are common to many and build some experimental tools to solve those big problems and to stay collaborative. But if we're going to solve climate change and fossil fuels and, and, and so forth, then we've got to be thinking in terms of 10 or 20,000 plants, which does mean workforce, it means young people, it means environmental impact statements, regulation, all of those other aspects. So I think the long view means that we've got to be preparing some of that way now so that once the technology is ready, um, there are not additional delays caused by policy or other kinds of glitches. That would be my best answer. Yeah, I would completely agree. We have to be um, thinking about these things now and uh, preparing for uh, you know, the, the wider, uh, or the further down the track. We have to be thinking about the decommissioning and the regulation. And I know that there are materials teams at UKAA as well who are thinking about, uh, about how, like, minimizing um, radioactivity and all of those kind of things. And that has to be part of the, the conversation as well. Thank you. I mean, unbelievably, we have reached the end of our time there. Are, I know online there are a few more questions that have come through from ITER. So I think what we'll try and do, Liam, and if it's OK with you, we'll try and grab you at the end and um, we'll get you to um, answer, see if sure. you can answer some of the questions um, online just in the little chat box. Um, but please, thank, let's thank Melanie and Laban once again for such a fantastic tour and showing us the progress of creation. Thank you thank so you. much.